Well, it's been a while. Have you missed me? Probably not. I have been under the weather, but we are back with some CST review. Uh, if you're not familiar, obviously I have a series on YouTube here with just three CST questions, trying to get CST exposed out there to the public, students, etc. Saw some of the comments in there about giving 10 questions. So that's today. We're going to give 10 questions uh, of CST. And the format I have is, well, I will read the question, put it up on the screen so you guys can see it. If you want to pause the video uh, and try to answer it, that's great. Um, and obviously, we're going to kind of go through that. Keep this under about 10 minutes uh, is my goal. Okay. So first question uh, that we're going to read. Um, now, CST, uh, these questions are all over the board in a sense of subject, so it's not really defined of pharmacology, sterile process, and there's going to be a random of questions on this video. So first question, we're going to jump into it, okay? Number one, and we'll put that on the screen right now. Uh, bladder, a bladder hernia that protrudes into the vagina, no, into the vagina wall is called a Vagoseal, anoseal, cystoseal, or rectoseal. So it protrudes into the vagina wall, right, from the bladder. Well, the correct answer is C, cystoseal. That is a rupture of the bladder into the vagina, right? C, cystoseal. First question, put it up on the screen. And we're gonna read it right now. Here we go. The cranial nerve that is responsible for vision. Is it A, olfactory? That was my reminder. Is it B, the optic nerve? Is it C, the transgeminal? Or is it D, the vagus nerve? Again, if you don't know, we're gonna tell you the question, show you the question on the screen. Push pause if you want to try to answer it, but I will tell you the answer at the end of the question. In this case, it's B, the optic nerve is responsible for vision, right? Question number two, in a total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, all of the following self retaino retractors are commonly used except, is it A, the Belfour? Is it B, O'Sullivan O'Connor? Is it C, Wheatlander? Or is it D, Bookwalter? Now, before you answer that, it says accept. And obviously, you can see on the question that they abbreviated it, right? And that's a total abdominal hysterectomy. BSO stands for bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, right? Self-retaining retractor are commonly used. Think about it. Well, it's the Wheatlander is the answer because it's small and is not typically used in large uh, cases, right? It's used for small incisions. O'Sullivan O'Connor is a large self retained retractor, Bell 4, and the Bookwalter is the largest of them all, right? Can be used in any of those scenarios, uh, but Wheatlander is not commonly used, right? Moving on to the next question. Question number three, which procedure love how they spell that procedure. Question number three, which procedure is commonly performed with a pyloroplasty? Say that 10 times, pyloroplasty. Is it A, a partial gastrectomy? Is it B, a vagotomy? Is it C, a cholecystectomy? Or D, a Whipple? Commonly used, what procedure is commonly performed with a pyloroplasty? Do you know what that is, Barlora? Answer is B, a vagotomy. Believe it or not, that is the vagus nerve. And obviously the pyloroplasty is a stenosis or narrowing in the pylorus, which is the end part of the stomach before it goes to the duodenum. Um, they'll make an incision, make an incision in that muscle. And obviously, uh, they'll make an incision in that pylorus muscle to relieve the stenosis within the pylorus. Now, the vagotomy part about it is sometimes in conjunction, they'll isolate that vagus nerve. Maybe there's an increase of gastric juices that are forming. So, a vagotomy 
is typically produced, commonly performed with a pyloroplasty. Um, so do some research on that pyloroplasty and vagotomy involves the vagus nerve, right? Otomy, vagus, vagotomy, vagus. I didn't spell it. That's just what it is. Question number four, put that up on the screen as soon as I find it. So question number five, during an orthopedic surgery intervention, bone wax is used to do what? Is it A, heal bone or help to heal the bone? Is it B, prevent bone infection? Is it C, seal off oozing blood? Or is it D, provide support to the bones? What do you guys think? Pause the video, try to answer it. I'm kind of limited it down to two here because they kind of both make sense. Uh, give you a second. The answer is obviously C. You want to seal off uh, oozing blood off of bones, but does it help the the heal of the bone? I guess in, in a sense, but really it's not helping to heal. It really is to it's a hemostatic agent or a mechanical hemostasis, is bone wax. But by definition, obviously test purposes, you want to seal off oozing uh, blood. Uh, in any aspect. So, question number six. Who is responsible for instruments, sponge, and sharp counts? And obviously these are people that do the count. Who is responsible for that? Is it A, the circulator in the CST? Is it B, the surgeon in the CST? Is it C, the circulator and the assistant? Or is it just you, D, the lonely CST? What do you guys think? Pause the video if you want. Who is responsible for doing counts? Correct answer is A, the circulator and the CST, okay? You are typically responsible for doing a count. The question is, how many counts do we do, typically? Three counts. When do we do that, right? The initial count, when we close up the peritoneum, and then we close up that final count, the skin layers. The other question you should be asking yourself, when do you do four counts? Look it up. There is a scenario. Four counts. What are we on? Five or six? I don't know. Going on to question number seven. Put that on the screen here. Let's rock and roll. The study of drugs and their actions on living organisms. The term is pharmacodynamics. Is it A, pharmacodynamics? Is it B, action potential? Is it C, pharmacokinetics? Or is it D, pharmacogenetics? The study of drugs and their actions on living organisms. I'll give you a second to answer that. One, two, three. I told you to pause it. It's A, pharmacodynamics. That's the action on living organisms. Pharmacokinetics is actually the movement of drugs, right? Through your body, all the way through the excretion. Anyways, A was your correct answer, pharmacodynamics. Pharmacodynamics. Question number eight. We're moving right along. The ligament that is used as an anatomical landmark to identify the end of the duodenum, or is it du duodenum? <laughs> So the identify the landmark to identify the end of the duodenum. Is it A, a round ligament? Is it B, cardinal ligament? Is it C, the ligament of trites? Or, the, or is it D, the crucial ligament, right? Give me a second, right? A landmark, anatomical landmark. Answer is C, the ligament of trites. So think about that when they're trying to run the bowel in an open surgery, right? We're running the small bowel. Typically, the jejunum, right? That's our, um, obviously, we're looking at the duodenum, the jejunum. They want to know where that begins uh, from the jejunum. So there's a ligament that attaches the jejunum to the, your diaphragm. It's a landmark that they look for when they're running the bowel and open, open kind of abdominal surgery. <clears throat> Question number nine, moving right along. The robotic arm on a da Vinci machine or remotely controlled hand is called what? Is it A, a telechair? Is it B, a cylinder? 
a C, a manipulator, <laughs> or is it D, android? Let's give you a second to think about that. Da Vinci, they got these arms. They see, they manipulate things, so they're manipulators, right? That is the correct answer. C, manipulator. Question number nine. If a patient's heart rate drops below 40 to 50 beats per minute, otherwise known as bradycardia, which medication could be administered to correct the problem? Is it A, epinephrine? Is it C? <laughs> Is it B, sodium bicarbonate? Is it C, atrophine, atrophine, or is it D, palpivrine? So this is a medication that they'll give you for bradycardia. The correct answer is A, epinephrine. And sometimes we'll have that available on our field. Um, I would say lidocaine typically can also be stimulating cardiac. Um, but epinephrine is a vasal constrictor, right? And sometimes they use that for any kind of bradycardia scenario. All right, you made it to the end. We're on 10. Question number 10. Question number 10 is a pretty easy one. Let's rock and roll. The surgeon would wish, a surgeon would wish to administer heparin to do what? Is it to dissolve, A, dissolve the clot? Is it C, locate the clot? Is it, is it B, locate the clot? Is it C, prevent the clot? Or is it D, promote clots? What's the purpose of administering heparin? And that is gonna be C, right? You wanna prevent clots, right? We don't wanna have the operative field full of little clots, right? So you thin that blood out the best you can. You can give that systemically by anesthesia, or you can have that on your field in a heparin, sep, um, heparin saline kind of flush with a 10 cc syringe. Uh, hopefully that was 10. Anyways, you made it to the end. I, I, I'm falling. You made it to the end. I appreciate it. And I apologize for not putting videos up. I will continue to put up CST types of questions. Why don't you suggest any kind of videos you're looking for? Obviously, we're trying to put up CST types of information. Uh, I haven't been in the lab lately because I have not had a class this term. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of externships and CST prep. Um, anyone that's out there that's doing CST, um, I actually recommend you suggesting some information that you want to see uh, or any types of questions. But keep studying. Uh, breaking down these questions are important. The more you're exposed to CST, the better you'll get at it because it is a broad spectrum of information. Uh, to try to have all that information in your head at one time. I know it's very difficult. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Uh, and sometimes you ask yourself, why do I need to know this? <laughs> uh, yeah, we need to know it for one reason alone, for the test, right? Obviously, if you want to further your career, that's a good thing. But a lot of these questions is about exposing yourself, breaking it down, limiting it statistically about knowing everything there is about questions. So if they ever reword the question or throw some scenario at you, at least you eliminated the idea of studying down to every scenario. So at least you have a higher percentage to pass in, right? So just to reiterate, the test is actually, you know, it's 175 questions, if you didn't know, uh, and we throw out 25, not me, obviously the MBS TSA, for different review, uh, trying to develop other questions. So it's really out of 150, right? They lower that standard a little bit. Doesn't mean that you have to, don't study as much, but they lower the standard a little bit. Used to be 102 the pass, it's now 98 the pass, which is a 65%. So um, I always say it's kind of hard to not pass, but that being said, make sure we try to maximize our effort at studying. That's important. Trying to, if you're in class right now, to look at anatomy, look at a question based, CSD question based on the subject subjects you're trying to learn. Give an example of you're going over anatomy. Try to isolate what CST is asking you on basic questions. So if you're taking out a gallbladder, so you should know the anatomy around there, right? Cystic duct, cystic artery, we're ligating those two areas. Uh, do you know what that triangle is called for the, the actual gallbladder surgery? Uh, you know, so 
trying to understand uh, questions based on, especially when you're out at externships, if you're doing a neuro case, a laminectomy, try to associate questions when you're in there in surgery. Doesn't always happen that way, but uh, that would be my advice when you're trying this study. Give me your tips. What are you, what are you, how are you studying? Um, but anyways, hopefully you enjoy the 10 questions. Uh, I find it a little bit more difficult trying to get 10 questions out myself, but <laughs> uh, hopefully there was 10. Did I miss it? And do you need a bonus one? Did you stick around? Are we at 10 minutes? No, we're not. We're at nine minutes and 19 seconds. So let me give you a bonus question for anyone that stuck around to the end. Anyone that logged off, logged off. That's so 1990. Anyone that did not watch to the end of the video is gonna miss out, right? So let me find you another question real quick. Anyways, you stuck around to the end. I Let's try to get this question up real quick. I'm not gonna pull it up real quick. It's in the top of my head right here. Malignant hypothermia. And I see this question all the time. There's two scenarios in it. Do you know what malignant hypothermia is? And what is the treatment for malignant hypothermia? Also, what is the trigger for malignant hypothermia? I give you two of the answers there. Treatment, dantrolene, right? Reconstituted dantrolene is the treatment. That's spelled D-A-N-T-R-O-L-E-N-E, -E, dantrolene. And the trigger is a muscle relaxant called succinylcholine, otherwise known as succus. It's spelled succus. <laughs> Anyways, you stuck around. Um, and I'll see you next time, guys. Uh, 10 questions. That's probably our goal now. Uh, we'll see how you respond to this. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You'll see my face somewhere in here. And obviously, there's some other videos on that side. Check them out. Share to your friends, to your mother. Just share the videos. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.